It's always a privilege to read uh, God's Word. It is the living Word of God. It's always a privilege to read it. And uh, today my privilege is to read this small part of Paul's letter. Just imagine Paul either dictating or writing. I don't think he was using an iPad or uh, had a stenographer there. But he was writing this letter 2,000 years ago. We are now listening to that same letter and it's my privilege to read it to you. The first, uh, we're reading from Ephesians chapter 3. Now the first half a dozen verses are all one sentence. So strap yourselves in and I'll try to read it as one sentence and then he finishes. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father for whom Every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. <laughs> now, almost like he sort of got that out of the road. Now, now, this wonderful passage. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power of his, at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks so much for that, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see you, and it is a privilege uh, not only to, uh, to yeah, read God's Word, but to explore it, uh, to consider it, and to reflect on uh, what it means for us and how we respond, uh, which we will do this morning. Well, we continue on in our fifth week of our Ephesians series, um, and uh, yeah, uh, um, going to try and recap a little bit of that uh, as we go along. Uh, let's pray before we get into this passage together. Loving God, we give you thanks for uh, this extraordinary uh, piece of uh, yeah, writing that has been retained throughout 2,000 years um, and for the way in which it has endured in its power and impact. Uh, Lord, as we explore it today, I just ask that you would help us to understand and comprehend its meaning. Lord, that you would lift our hearts and our minds to all that it draws our attention to and that we would leave here um, shaped by and motivated by all that is contained within it. Uh, so Lord, we give you thanks for it and ask for your work in our lives right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so in our Ephesians series so far, just going to do a bit of a recap, you know, like how they do a, you know, what you've missed so far when you, uh, when you start a, a, a uh, when you jump into a, a series, a TV series, and they want to catch you up because there's important stuff within this episode that's good to know. Um, so, where we've been so far. First message in the first week, we looked at God's master plan, where Paul talks about uh, the fact that God's master plan is not just to redeem us and, and, you know, the gospel for us, but that ultimately the grand plan in all things is to unite all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Remember that? Well, that's, that's his ultimate goal, his ultimate end thing. So our salvation, our individual redemption, reconciliation, all of those sorts of things is part of that grander plan. And then in the second week, we looked at Paul then prays, for this reason, I pray this. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened to know the reality of this in, in its full measure. Remember, we looked at that whole IQ and EQ thing. He's saying, now that God has given you spiritual IQ into his master plan, I pray that it also grabs you, 
your spiritual EQ to understand in full measure what God is doing and what this means, that he's uniting all things under Christ for all eternity. It's one thing to know it in your head, it's another thing entirely to know it in the depths of your being. So Paul says, for this reason, I'm going to pray this. And then we looked at a couple of sections where Paul outlines the impact on humanity of that particular master plan and what God is doing. So individually, the impact for us is that we are made alive in Christ. We were once dead, we were made alive. We were once slaves to sin, but we have been raised up in Christ. Uh, A difference has been made to us individually. And then he looks at corporately, there is an outcome as well of the gospel, is that we have been made one in Christ. Jew and Gentile have been reconciled. So if we are saved by grace, then we are part of the same family. We might have our differences in many different aspects, but we are reconciled to one another. We are part of the same family. That's what's happened as a result of Christ's death and resurrection. And so Paul now again says, for this reason, I'm going to pray this. That's important. So this incredible prayer that we're going to look at today is not prayed in a vacuum. This is not Paul just sort of coming up and saying, I don't know, I feel it's about time to pray and I'm just going to pray some random, generic, nice-sounding prayer that everyone will feel all fluffy and heart-warmed by. Paul is saying, because this has happened, for this reason, I'm now going to pray this. We're going to circle back to that reason later on after we take a look at the prayer itself. So let's start again from verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, sadly, the uh, NIV translation here is a little bit unhelpfully misleading. Not intentional, but They've uh, chosen to to translate uh, or to use out of rather than according to his glorious riches, which is the same word in verse 20. So out of there and according to is the same Greek word, right? They've just translated it slightly differently to kind of probably make sure that there's not a whole lot of repetition when when you read something, particularly when it's one sentence. Uh, But I think it's a little bit misleading in a subtle but significant way. Try and give you an example. Say you're out at a restaurant and, uh, you know, a family and you've got your child there uh, and they're doing a fundraising activity for school, right? They're trying to, you know, sell, sell little tickets or something like that. They're trying to raise money for the school, you know... Portable, portable buildings to be actually built, right? So they're, they're just, you know, trying to raise money. And you've gone out to this sort of fairly nice restaurant, right? And in walks someone you know is really rich. Bill Gates, right? Don't go to the point of analysing why Bill Gates would be in the same restaurant as you as a family, but anyway, they just say Bill Gates walks into this restaurant. And, uh, and you're like... We're raising money here. He'd be a good option, wouldn't he? Right? So your child fronts up to Bill Gates and says, Excuse me, Mr. Gates, would you mind contributing, donating to this our school building project? And Bill Gates says, Yeah, sure, I'd love to. That's really exciting, isn't it? And he writes out, or he hands over a, a five dollar note. And the child comes back and you think, ooh, yeah, right. Bill Gates has given out of his incredible wealth, but he hasn't given according to it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Massive difference. Subtle, but significant. So, he's, you know, he gives this particular gift and, yeah, it's out of that incredible wealth, but it's not at all according to or in line with. Right? Remember, that, that, that's the same word that we looked at uh, in another week where we talked about the, the following slavery in line with. 
Uh, it's the same Greek word. So Paul, what Paul is saying here is that in line with reflective of God's glorious wealth, he wants him to give you this strength and this power. Make sense? Massive difference. It's not just a little bit out of God's glorious wealth, but according to his glorious wealth, that it would be abundantly given. And there's a very good reason for why I think that word is important, because as Paul goes on, he prays for three huge things for these Ephesian believers. He goes on, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, so what he's just talked about over the last couple of passages, where Christ's love has reconciled us to God and reconciled us to one another, this, uh, this love that we have been um, uh, recipients of, that you may have power together with all the saints. So he's praying this for us too, good news. He's not now just praying this for the Ephesians, he's praying this for us too, together with all the saints. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now question, how wide is the love of Christ? Anyone venture? East to west? How long is that? How wide is it? Yeah. It's kind of, what would the word be? In immeasurable infinity, it's just not, there's no definition on it, right? And, you know, is it, is it arm width? Is it 10 kilometres? Is it 10 million kilometres? The width of his love is limitless. The length of his love, the height of his love, the depth of his love is limitless. But Paul's prayer is that we would grasp it. And this word grasp literally means to apprehend, to catch, to hold on to. It's more than just grab, grasp cognitively, but to literally take hold of. So just imagine for a moment, trying to grab hold of a massive old tree maybe some of you have done this type of thing before right <clears throat> you go into a forest there's a massive tree there you go up and and try and hug it just in your mind imagine that feeling for a moment right you go up and you're hugging this tree you're grasping this tree how does that feel now with that in your mind imagine grasping uluru okay it's a bit, bit bigger a bit more difficult to grasp hold of right Okay, now, in light of that, try and imagine grabbing the planet Jupiter. Right? Forget about gravity and oxygen and all that sort of stuff, but you come up to, to planet Jupiter, the biggest one in our solar system, and you're trying to grab that now. Now, Jupiter, of course, in comparison to the universe, is just a teeny tiny speck. But then, even the universe is a teeny tiny speck compared to the infinite limitless love of God which we've already established is limitless are you starting to get a feel for what Paul's praying here he's praying that we would grasp somehow that which is ungraspable it can't be measured Christ's love is so infinitely huge but Paul prays that somehow we would grab it he then goes on to pray that we would know this love that surpasses knowledge. And I want to, that's a paradoxical statement, isn't it? If something surpasses knowledge, well, it can't be known. And yet Paul is praying that we would know it. So, another example. Imagine going to Sydney University Library reading every single book in that entire library and retaining that information. But that's just Sydney Uni Library. Imagine now going to every single library on the face of the planet and retaining all of that information. And yet all of that information is still only a teeny tiny speck of all the possible information that we could know about God's love. But Paul prays that we would know that. Are you catching on to a bit of a theme here? He doesn't stop there. He also prays that you may be filled to the measure 
of all the fullness of God. Now, I'm going to use this as a prop. Imagine this is us, a human, right? How much do you think the fullness of God is in comparison to what this can contain? Essentially, it would be, in comparison to this, every drop in every ocean on the face of the planet, yes? Paul is praying that that measure will be contained in here, right? So if this is a human life, Paul is praying that we would be filled, not just to the measure of the cup, but that we would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He's praying that every fullness of God would be contained in this. How on earth is that supposed to happen? So Paul has gone big here, hasn't he? It's a great prayer and it's a massive prayer. I mean, it makes praying for an end to world hunger seem lame and lacking in faith. Through this prayer, Paul is calling us to imagine the impossible with him. He gives us this picture of three impossible scenarios that we would grasp that which is infinitely, the, the, the infinitely large love of Christ, that we would know that which is surpassing knowledge and that we would be filled by his presence way beyond our capacity. Paul invites us to dream the impossible dream with him, to pray the impossible prayer. He knows he's literally asking God to do the impossible. And here's where it gets good. Having already enlarged our minds in getting us to imagine something way beyond our comprehension, like we're sitting here already at the moment going, wow, Paul is just... He's, he's letting it all go now. He's, he's dreaming the impossible. This is even beyond what we can comprehend. Paul then goes on to say, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than even we've now just imagined. According to his power that is at work within us. So Paul gets us to imagine a concept that is beyond measure and he says that God can do immeasurably more than that. That's like asking a mathematician, what's 100 to the power of infinity to the power of infinity? And Paul says, that's what God's capable of. How cool is that? Paul knows he is praying for the impossible. But this is not just some flowery prayer. This is not something that he's just putting out there going, oh, I just pray that God does this for you and that'll be all nice. Paul is praying what he knows to be impossible because he is confident it will happen because he is asking the God of the impossible to do it. Paul's not worried that his prayers are too audacious. Because he knows that God is more than capable of doing way more than he can even imagine. The most outlandish thing that Paul can comprehend, God can do immeasurably more than that. I hope, if nothing else, that gives you a bit of a shot in the arm when it comes to your own prayer life. That you're reminded exactly of what God is capable of. You see, sometimes I think we can be a bit timid with our prayers. And perhaps it's a little bit of a lack of belief in what God is capable of. And I'm not talking about the, the, the belief that God can do anything, because we know it here, don't we? It's like that IQ, EQ thing. We all know that God can do anything, but do we really know it? Do we believe it? Do our prayers reflect the fact that we believe that God can do anything? Paul lays it out here. God can do way more than even what you dare to hope or dream might be possible. 
Perhaps this is a timely reminder for some of us here. Perhaps you're facing a situation that you feel is way beyond your capacity to control or to make a difference. And you're feeling like there's nothing you can do about it and you feel overwhelmed, anxious and lost. Then this is your reminder that God can do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. Essentially, through the Apostle Paul's words here, God has extended an invitation to his children to ask big things. But what's our response to that invitation? Do we just say, oh, that's nice to know? Or is it, I'm going to take you up on that invitation, God, and I'm going to pray boldly, courageously, and confidently? Now, before you unleash on some wild prayers, there's an important thing to note. Paul says God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. There's that phrase again, according to, in line with. God will answer prayers beyond our asking or imagination that are in line with what he is already doing in us under Christ. Now that's an important little caveat, isn't it? According to God's power that is at work within us, God has already commenced a work in us through Christ. He has made us alive when we were dead. He has raised us up when we were slaves. In line with those purposes, he is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. So this isn't an invitation to go out and pray for the impossible for the sake of it. Lord, you can do all things. Help me win the lottery. Did someone say amen? (laughs) Rhema, I I thought it was you. Bad luck, he's not going to answer that prayer. But he will answer prayers that reflect or are in line with the reconciling, renewing, restoring work he has begun through Christ. That's why, as we saw at the beginning, Paul says, for this reason, I pray this. Paul is not just praying this prayer in a vacuum. Or just offering some generic prayer for all Christians because it sounds really lovely. He's praying this impossible prayer because of what he's just talked about. What was that again? Well, firstly, individually, we have been made alive in Christ. And corporately, we have been made one in Christ. And Paul says, because of that, I'm praying this. Why? Because if we are going to live out the reality of that, we are going to need supernatural help. If I have been made alive in Christ, if I am set free to be someone who is no longer self-centered but rather is created to serve others, if I am going to be the showpiece of God's kindness to the world looking on that Paul says, I need the power of God to enable me to do that, don't I? And if we have been if I have been reconciled not only to God but also to my fellow believer, If we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but we are fellow citizens in God's family, then I am going to need help to live out that reality because at times there will be deep differences between us. Make sense? That's why Paul prays that we will know God's love in infinite measure because This is an impossible reality to live out unless we understand both here and here 
the abundance of God's love. And that's what Paul spends the remainder of this letter unpacking. What it means for us to live out the calling we have individually and corporately. So he's laid out the theological truth of all that has happened in Christ. And he's about to get on to what that means and how we live it out. But he knows that it's one thing entirely to know what God has done and it is something entirely different to actually be able to live that out and so Paul says for this reason I get on my knees and pray for supernatural infinite help because you are going to need it because what we are called to live out under Christ who we are called to be individually and corporately is something way beyond what we can manage on our own so God help us all to live out the reality of all you have done but once again as he has done every passage we have looked at so far Paul lifts our gaze to see the bigger picture of what's going on and what this is all about he finishes to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen after Paul has explained all that God can do in us and for us, that is far beyond our comprehension or imagination, he reminds us again that it is not all about us. God doesn't answer our prayers beyond our imagination because we're the centre of the universe. God isn't some powerful genie in the sky just waiting to do incredible things at our beckoning. God answers our prayers when they align with his eternal plan to unite all things under Christ, including the church, made up of people from generations past and generations to come, that we would be for his glory and praise for all eternity. That is the God we worship. That is whom, to whom, belongs the glory this week by God's power at work in you may you grasp more of his love may you know more of his love and may you be filled more by his love to the glory of God let's pray Libway, but you are our loving Father. And as Paul has explored here in our passage this morning, that love is immeasurable. Help us to comprehend what that even means. Lord, we thank you for that love demonstrated in Jesus on the cross for that love demonstrated in your ongoing faithfulness to us day by day and that incredible love planted in us by your spirit as a seal of all that awaits us the inheritance that we have ahead of us lord we thank you for your love and what it has made the the difference it has made for us and so lord in line with what paul has prayed this morning lord we ask that we would know more of your love in order that we would be able to live out that love in this world for the glory of god we pray in jesus name amen